Welcome to the closing keynote address of the 42nd ASH annual meeting. I would like to start by acknowledging on behalf of the association all of those who have served in our military on this Veterans Day, and I can only hope that those who are gay, lesbian, and transgender will also have future opportunities to serve in the branches of our military. So two nights ago, I stood at this podium and demanded that we abandon the pursuit of pointless questions. But just for old time's sake, I'm gonna start with a pointless question. How lit was Ash After Dark last night? <laughs> All right. Listen, we are very uh, pleased to have Mark Lamont Hill with us this morning as our closing speaker. Mark is many things. He is most significantly Anya's daddy. She's 13, he's 38. He is an activist who is always on the front lines fighting for justice and telling the truth. He is a public intellectual. We see him on CNN and BET News and we've seen him on Fox News Channel and we've seen him on the Basketball Wives uh, reunion show, which he's hosted. <laughs> and on VH1 Live and HuffPost Live, Mark really does use his voice and his platform to tell the truth. Mark is an author of several peer-reviewed journal articles and several prize-winning direction-shifting books including Beats, Rhymes, and Classroom Life, which is one of the most adopted books in teacher education programs. He's also co-author of a book, The Classroom in the Cell. His newest book, which was just released a few months ago, is called Gentrifier. And my favorite book of Mark's, which I argue is the most significant literary contribution of this decade, is titled Nobody, Casualties on America's, wait, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a war on, the vulnerable, on vulnerable Americans from Ferguson to Flint, but the title of the book is Nobody. Um, it really is, if you have not read that book, you should read it immediately. It is, it is really, really fantastic. So Mark is an author. He also is a teacher. He's taught at Morehouse College, and at Teachers College, Columbia University, and now he has recently returned to Temple University as the Steve Charles Chair in Media Solutions and Cities, um, and he also teaches in the College of Education there at Temple. Mark is the 426th person to sign the Ash DACA statement. I encourage the rest of you to continue to sign and share the link with your colleagues back on your campuses and in your respective networks. Like Charles Davis and Steve Mobley and Spencer Platt and me, Mark is a noob, a pretty boy of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Like me, he is a staunch appreciator of fried chicken like my husband, Sean, Mark is a baker. And perhaps most importantly to me, he's one of my closest friends and a person that I very much consider a role model. Uh, so listen, I'm gonna bring to the stage the closing speaker for our 42nd annual conference, Mark Lamont Hill. Good morning, everybody. Excuse my voice, I've been uh, running and traveling uh, for a few weeks now, and I haven't gotten my voice back yet. Uh, 
I'm so excited to see this many people for a Saturday morning session at an academic conference. That's mind blowing to me. And then I heard the Ash After Dark was lit, so I I couldn't even make. I'm getting old. I just fell asleep, but I'm still excited to see you all here. And of course, how could I not be here when my dear brother Sean Harper invites me? If Sean Harper invites you, you show up. And the reason you show up when Sean Harper invites you is because Sean Harper always shows up. He shows up for black men in his scholarship. He shows up for his students. He shows up for his mentees. He shows up for the hundreds of people that walk up to senior faculty at conferences with their CVs and their ideas and their dissertation committee requests. I ain't saying he's gonna be on all y'all committees, but he says yes to a lot of people. He is generous, he is brilliant, and although I'm angry that he went all the way to the West Coast, leaving me in cold Philadelphia, I still consider him a, a dear friend, and uh, I thank you for inviting me, and I'm excited to be here for a conference that is titled, or subtitled, well, I ain't there no more, but Power to the People. <laughs> Power to the People. Do you see that? You know Ash got a black president when that's the title and that's the logo. Like, the board didn't approve that. He just went straight up, put that on. By the time they saw the afro, it was too late. <laughs> but that's how black folk gotta move in the academy. You gotta move without observation. Because by the time they find out what you're doing, it has to already be done because there are so many things that operate against us. So many things that operate against the possibility of giving power to the people. So the question becomes first for me, why is it so necessary right now to be demanding power to the people? It's not the first time we saw it. Sean Harper's brilliant. He understood the connection between saying power to the people in 2017 and 55 years ago, Black Panthers calling for power to the people against their oppressive state apparatus, against police terrorism, against state violence, against crumbling educational institutions, against food insecurity, against wars internationally, against a media narrative that continues to articulate falsehoods but constructing them as truths. He understood the historical connection between power to the people with Panthers and radical movements everywhere, not just in the United States, but in Latin America, in South Africa, in North Africa, in the Middle East. He understood the connection between those things. So when he calls for power to the people, he's, t he's conjuring up a revolutionary sensibility. A revolutionary sensibility. Right now in the academy, we need a revolutionary sensibility because we're facing a counter-revolutionary apparatus. We imagine, within the context of the American democratic experiment, that education is the ultimate palliative. That education will be the thing that saves us. I mean, part of the mythology of the American promise is that anybody can be successful. Not that everybody can, but that anybody can. And the thing that is supposed to be the engine, the animating force behind the American democratic promise is education, that if only you had access to education. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attachment to an enlightenment sensibility. When enlightenment logics and philosophers were suggesting that the world is discoverable, that the world is knowable, and that if we could just engage and know the world a little bit more, we could get smarter and better and the world could be more just and everybody could have access. And in some sense that was always true, but those truth claims had asterisks attached to them. Oh yeah, everybody could be successful, unless you ain't got no land, unless you're a woman, unless you're black, unless you're brown. There's always these asterisks attached to it. The American Democratic Experiment is linked to a belief in education as an ultimate ideal and as an ultimate force. But as we move through the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, what we see is that education doesn't do that for everybody. Partly because of denied access, and partly because the project itself at its heart 
didn't have the capacity to end class antagonism, to end anti-black racism, to end homophobia. Didn't have the capacity to wrestle with these questions. We needed to reimagine the structure itself. But higher education, oh, if you get there, you good. If you just, if you can get to college, you Gucci. That's what the founding fathers said. <laughs> Jefferson had a very interesting logic. I mean, it makes sense for Jefferson. <laughs> and so we've assigned to higher education a grander ideal. That's where the most radical thinkers are. That's where the freest spirits are. That's where you can articulate dangerous and counterintuitive truth claims without them being destroyed or without being marginalized because you have the protections of tenure. That's where students can grow and be transformed and radicalized. That's where the best ideas can be thought and said. But once again, although that has never been entirely true, it has become even less true in the 21st century neoliberal university context. In the 21st century, that university ideal that we imagined, this idea that the American university is a bastion of democracy or democratic possibilities, is gone. The university operates much more like a multinational corporation than it does like a site of higher learning. University presidents operate more and more like corporate CEOs than they do stewards of student development. The logics of capitalism play out in the university just as much as they do in any multinational corporation. You might as well be on the board of Walmart if you're on the board of a university. They trying to figure out how to maximize wealth, maximize income, even if you're not for profit, you're still maximizing income, maximizing your profit margins. And as a result, what we see is the casualization of labor. These universities have more and more adjuncts, fewer and fewer tenure line faculty, graduate students being overworked and underpaid. They don't, they're not indexing the stipends for inflation. Not that they were that good before, back in my day. I'm just saying, it's been a minute now. If you ain't, I, I, I finished grad school, I started grad school 17 years ago. <laughs> if, if, the, if the stipend is the same, it's a problem. Because milk ain't the same, butter ain't the same, eggs ain't the same, black and miles ain't the same. They not. So graduate students are being asked to do more and more work for less and less income. They're being, some of them are teaching three and four classes. Undergraduates are going through their entire college experience without encountering tenure line faculty, some of them. They, get, they ask for letters of recommendation. The only people they have are graduate students. And there's nothing wrong with graduate students, except that ain't what they paid for. And then graduate students are being asked to finish their doctoral work at the same time that they're teaching two and three and four classes, at the same time that they have fewer and fewer faculty support to support their work, and then they don't get the funding to do research, and they're being made into glorified teaching assistants for their entire career. That's not what training is about, but it fits within the logic of a university that has decided to colonize the hood. So you go to Temple University where I'm at. You go to Penn where I went. You go to Columbia where I went. Maybe gentrification is my problem. I don't know, but every school I done been to they keep expanding like settler colonial nation states on the hood, displacing local residents without any place to go. The university is getting bigger and bigger. They're not giving living wages to the people who work there. Forget just about yourself for a minute. Think about the person on campus doing security. Think about the person on campus doing the lunch work or doing the janitorial work. They don't get a living wage either. Again, it is the corporatization of the university at the same time that free speech itself is under attack. Power to the people. Power to the people means that we have to allow for the people's voices to speak. But if Stephen Salada gets offered a job at University of Illinois, Urbana, Champaign, 
And before he gets to the campus, they don't like what he tweeted. What he tweeted is divisive. What he tweeted about Palestine and the war on Gaza is divisive. We can't have that on campus. They gave him the contract. He left his job, then he gets to Urbana, and they say, well, we didn't officially give you the job yet. Now, he done moved. They done already gave him his teaching load. And he loses his job at Urbana before he gets there. Because they don't like what he said. They found his words divisive and offensive. Anybody read the bell curve? That was divisive and offensive. Anybody? Read John McWhorter. Divisive and offensive. Read these narratives of deficit that suggest that black kids can't learn as well, or a president of a university says that maybe women aren't as good at math. Imagine a statement coming out that we are against trans bathrooms, a gender neutral bathroom. Those statements are divisive and offensive. They're not against things that are divisive and offensive. They are against particular narratives that they find offensive that offend their sensibilities around protecting white supremacy, around protecting imperialism, around protecting homophobia, around protecting transphobia. Power to the people says we allow their voices to speak. The university is becoming increasingly hostile to diversity. Diversity itself is being constructed as a problem that they have to bear, rather than an institutional asset. If we are to really have power to the people, we have to understand that there is power in the people. Universities are better for having black folk in them. Y'all not giving us the hookup. Y'all giving yourselves the hookup. The Supreme Court got hooked up when Sonia Sotomayor was there. She was right. A wise Latina does something for justice. There's something to be said about the power of the people being in these places. But you can't say there's power in the people if you don't support the people when they get there. Don't tell your university to go out and recruit in the hood, have college fairs in the hood, but don't have no money to get the kids from the hood to the university. Because it doesn't matter to recruit people if you don't keep people. What good is it to, have, to keep people if you don't mentor people, if you don't have any mentors that look like them? If you don't have any faculty that look like them? You can't keep them. See, I'm sorry. I, oh, I, I, they gave me the check already. I'm good. I can say whatever I want. All right. I get nervous. The reason we call for power to the people is because organized people always defeat organized power. Let me say that again. Organized people always defeat organized power. And power is organized to protect its own interests. You see, I don't care how nice the brochure is, I don't care how liberal your colleagues are, universities don't have feelings. Universities have interests. And as critical race theorists have taught us, the only way to get social change is for those interests to converge with the interests of the people. But that ain't gonna happen because they get religion. They ain't gonna fall off no horse. There's not gonna be a theophany. They're not gonna get a crisis of conscience. We have to demand more from universities that at the current moment simply don't love black bodies. Simply don't love queer bodies. Simply don't love trans bodies, simply don't love poor bodies. See, love is perhaps not even the right emotion, the right framing for universities. But if we were to use that framing, your, the measure of your love is how you engage me, how you treat me, not what you tell me in private. I don't care what them text messages say. If I don't, if you don't talk to me in public, if you act like you don't know me when you see me in public, maybe you don't love me. If I don't see you on your birthday, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> maybe you don't love me. 
If I ain't met your family, maybe you don't love me. So if I'm a student on campus and I walk through the campus for the campus brochure and every Negro from the website is the only Negroes I meet on campus, all eight of them, maybe you don't love me. If I come to the campus and I walk into the math department, the science department, the engineering department, and there are no women in the department, yet you say you believe in women engineers and women STEM fields, but there are none on the faculty, maybe you don't love me. Maybe if there are no grants, no money, no stipends, no investment in my graduate career, maybe just you say you want me here, but do you really want me here? Because if you really wanted me here, you'd put your money where your mouth is. Everybody got a dream, but I need a budget. You don't love me. How do you love me when I walk through the campus and the only people that look like me, and believe me, there is dignity in all labor. Ain't nothing wrong with working in the cafeteria. Ain't nothing wrong with working security. Y'all grandmamas and them did that. My grandmama and them did that. There's dignity in all labor. But if the only labor that shows my face is one kind of job, then maybe you don't love me. Why ain't the black faculty here? Why can't you ever find somebody qualified? I'm a black student, student affairs folk. But the only speakers that come in don't speak to my needs. We talk about climate and culture, but the cafeteria don't serve no fried chicken. Me and Sean Hill walking through the school looking like, where the chicken at? And if there is chicken, ain't no hot sauce. I ain't say Tabasco sauce. There is a difference. When I walk into a campus and I see, I need some hot sauce, and they gave me some Tabasco, that's a microaggression. I want some Louisiana, I want some Franks. Give me something good, if you love me. Let me stop, y'all got me tripping. But y'all know what I'm saying, right? Y'all with me, family? To diversify the campus and really assign power to the people is not just to have brown bodies in the space. It's to radically reorganize the cultural logic of the space. It's to radically shift the curriculum in the space such that you see value in my presence. That means don't just give me a black studies class, make white folk take it. If you see power in the people. Because if there's really power in my narrative as a Latina, then why are only Latinas taking these courses? They need to understand, men need to take Courses on in dark and feminist epistemologies. What good is it for a bunch of women to take feminist studies if men are the ones causing the problems? Campus rape culture is prevalent. It is normative. It is not an outlier. The, the logic and culture of rape culture is prevalent on every campus in America. I don't care if you don't believe me. I don't care what you say. There is a logic that says that female bodies are disposable that they are vulnerable, and even if you don't have a campus assault, you got campus catcalling, you got campus street harassment. We have normalized the culture of objectifying and sexualizing and ultimately destroying women's bodies on campuses. So, I mean, taking some feminist courses is cool, but maybe men need to be taking them. Maybe it's our work to end, no, it is our work to end rape culture on college campuses. It is our work. But you can't do that without organized people. I know I done gave y'all some bad news about how dark the moment is, but I don't know, I've, I've never felt more optimistic. I have never been more confident in our victory, the victory of the people, than I am right here and right now at this moment in history. And I'm gonna tell you why. Whew, mercy.
Before I tell you, I need y'all to dream with me for a minute. Y'all do that. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. The halls from the throat. I'm going to use this in one second. The only way that we can imagine new institutional futures, new educational futures, new educational possibilities is to release our imaginations. Because I told you what the problem is. I want to help us move toward fixing this thing. But we can't fix this thing if we don't allow for new possibilities. The great educational philosopher Maxine Green dared us to release our imaginations. What do I mean? I mean, let us not be prisoner to the current moment. Let us not be hostage to statistics and to the pessimism of this exact junction in time. Because the moment is dark. But the moment's always dark. The only way to move beyond this moment into something bigger and brighter and better is to not be prisoner to the moment. The great theologian Howard Thurman said, never scale down your dream to the level of that which is your immediate experience. Never be prisoner of the event. The event is neoliberal universities. The event is anti-black racism. The event is state violence. The event is homophobia. The event is imperialism. But I'm asking you all to have a more ambitious freedom dream than the current moment. Don't scale it down. Don't dream of warmer and fuzzier prisons. Imagine a world without prisons. Don't keep figuring out how to regulate capitalism. Maybe we can imagine a world without capitalism. Dream more ambitiously. People say, well, we have to be pragmatic, especially y'all higher ed folk. Y'all walk around with suits on and bow ties. Can't go to higher ed conference without a Negro in a bow tie, I swear. And they're always the ones that say, let's be pragmatic. Let's, we have to think about the moment. This system can't change. Systems always change. When we demand that they change, slavery wasn't supposed to end. People said, oh, it's just the natural culture. It's our economy. It's how things work. We can regulate it. We can make it saucer, but we can't end it. That's how things always have been. How will we live? What will we do with people? What will we do with the income? It was impossible to end until it ended. I'm asking you all to dream about new possibilities. Don't be prisoner to the moment. But then, I talked about organized people. So organized people dream together, but organized people work together. They build together. If you are to organize against power, you must have a diverse and inclusive cadre of allies. How you do that? Well, the first thing you have to do is step outside the university. Because you all can have work that challenges elitism and work that talks about the people, but some of y'all ain't met the people. Some of y'all ain't seen the people since y'all left the people when y'all went to school. Some of y'all wouldn't recognize the people if they walked up on you. Some of y'all would lock your windows when the people did roll up on you. We have to be honest about who we are. Stop asking why the community ain't coming to you. You need to go to the community. Because the university, I don't care if you live two blocks from the university, the university has always marked itself as a space that the hood can't occupy. As places, I, went, I grew up in North Philly and couldn't walk on Temple campus. I moved to West Philly and still didn't think Penn was good for me. It didn't feel open or welcoming. We have to have outreach. We have to recognize the resources in the community and engage the community because otherwise we are just another occupying force. We can't just organize for faculty rights if we're not organizing for the rights of the people who work on campus and other jobs. I can't tell you how many campuses I go to where the union is organized for the faculty and they don't say a word about the folk making the food in the cafeteria. They don't say a word about the folk cleaning the campus. They don't even know the name of the person cleaning their office. 
Don't say power to the people unless you're talking about all people. All people. Now, once you got all people in there, we have to recognize that all people aren't positioned the same. The, the, the narrative of power to the people challenges us not just to think about the power of the people, but also think about the relationship of power amongst the people. In other words, when we're all organized together, there are power dynamics that play out given gender, given class, given race. So as you organize with black faculty, as you organize with brown faculty, I'm talking to white folk now if you ain't catch on, you have to keep track and recognize your whiteness. Because we can never have an organized people if we allow whiteness to be the serpent wrapped around the table. Whiteness must be destroyed. Whiteness must end. Whiteness must die. Now, I see y'all shifting a little bit. I ain't saying white people must die. I don't want y'all getting nervous. Stop payment on this joint right here. It, But whiteness as an idea, as unmerited power, as the arbiter of competing truth claims, as the normative model for how the world works, as the reason why the student walks into the campus bookstore and can't find no hair care products that look like them or, or, or stuff that grows out of their hair or, or why you can't find a wave brush or a do-rag as the reason why flesh color band-aids in the blackest, you can be HBCU and the flesh color band-aids still gonna be peach, right? As Peggy McIntosh taught us, it's because we have a normative understanding of whiteness. Whiteness governs not just how we look and how we feel in the university, it governs what constitutes an acceptable knowledge claim. It governs whose stories count so that we'll allow black people to tell a story, but we won't allow black people to make sense of it in such a way that they get understood as a theorist of that story. So we can have David Walker's appeal or a lot of Equiano's narrative, but we call them slave narratives. But we allow white philosophers with the same story to be considered existentialists. Black people bring stories, white people bring theory. That has become the intellectual division of labor within the academy. De your stories ain't just counter stories. They are theorizations of an analysis of a moment and of an idea. Don't cede that to white folk. White folk aren't the only people with theory. David Walker had a theory. Alain Equiano had a theory. Mariah Stewart had a theory. We can't allow whiteness to determine that, and too often, white understandings and white epistemologies overdetermine the intellectual output of the academy. So when we send stuff to referee journals, when we submit things to book publishers, I don't recognize this framework, you don't say. <laughs> but what it means to decenter whiteness is to say that just because you don't understand it, just because it doesn't reflect your experience, doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it ain't white. And that's okay. Sometimes it's better than okay. Y'all don't hear me though, it's cool. This is why I don't get invited to conferences that often. We must shift the intellectual division of labor. We must expand our inventory of ideas. We must shift our units of analysis So that as we're studying the social world and social problems, we're not just looking at the conditions of blackness, we're also interrogating the positionality of whiteness or the positionality of maleness or the positionality of straightness. Black folk keep getting pulled over on highways. It's cool to study driving while black, but we should also be studying patrolling while racist. That might actually fix the problem. It's an epistemological shift. I know we ain't got much time. I apologize. I'm gonna leave y'all alone. Just give me one more second. Power to the people means that we organize to dismantle the system that we're in. 
not to fight to become a part of the system that we're in. We can't complain about these review boards and then you get tenure, you get on a review board and you, that's right, you do the same. What good is that? You're just a proxy for white power. What good is that? Some of y'all finishing, don't mentor nobody. Maybe not the people in this room because y'all woke up at 9.30, y'all probably already about it, but there's a whole bunch of folk I know who get in the door and then close it behind them. Power to the people means that you expand power to the people. You don't hoard power. You fight to get other tenure lines. You fight to get black faculty. And you fight to mentor, not just the ones in your school. The whole point of Ash is so that you can put possibilities together from folk in other institutions, folk who don't have the luxury of having a Sean Harper, a brilliant black scholar of having a Charles H. F. Davis III, a brilliant Puerto Rican scholar, of having a range of possibilities. You don't have that luxury. So you mentor folk from other schools, other universities. That's what we're supposed to be doing, raising up the next generation of leadership, training for leadership. Organized power means that we help students resist. August 9, 2014, Mike Brown was killed. We watched his body lay on the ground in Ferguson. It was a dark moment. It was a sad moment. But the story of Ferguson isn't the story of August 9. It's the story of, or of, August, of August 10th. On August 10th, a nation of people organized. Students, faculty, grassroots folk, academics, mill workers, didn't matter. And we've seen a sustained resistance to state violence ever since. At Mizzou, a chancellor was fired. The president was fired. Why? Not because the school got religion, not because the school recognized white supremacy and all of its problematic dimensions. No, it's because the students resisted. And not just the students resisted, the football team resisted. Again, organized people beats organized power every single time. The school didn't change its mind because they made a brilliant platform about white supremacy, about white privilege, because they made institutional and curricular demands. The football team walked off the field. And they saw that million dollars a week walking off the field. And they didn't want ESPN to be looking why there's only one team on the field. See, institutions don't like bad press. They have huge egos. They love to celebrate themselves. They love to talk about their accomplishments. They love to talk about every awesome thing they've done. We're the number one science technology department that begins with the letter F in the Northeast Corridor. <laughs> They'll find the most ridiculous thing to celebrate of themselves about, but that's what they do within the neoliberal context because it's always a fight for scarce resources. So when they saw that football team walk off the field, they saw money walking off the field, the interest converged, and they yielded. That's what the students did. That's what the people did. But as faculty, as student services, as graduate students, we have to help organize them so that they can do the work that they're supposed to do. We should be down there with those students, not just right upstairs writing books about social movements, not just doing qualitative studies of social movements. We should be downstairs in the social movement. We should be downstairs organizing the social movement, being an ally to social movements, being helpful to a social movement is integral to what we need to do to assign power to the people. So when you go back to your campus next week, I want you to find student organizations if you haven't already. I want you to link with community organizations and figure out how your work, how your resources, how your time, how your talents can be an asset to changing and dismantling the current structure of the university. And I don't care how nice you think your liberal university is. I spoke at a school a couple days ago. I ain't gonna say the school's name, 
is Rutgers, New Brunswick. And the president told me, well, we support protests. We even give students a protest area. They can protest all they want. Look at Raheem over there protesting. <laughs> Go ahead, protest for him, Raheem. That's what it sounded like. The institution of power cannot give you the tools to defeat it. They will not. If they say the protest area is over there, you need to be where? Over there. <laughs> you need to be anywhere to make the university uncomfortable. As you fight for workers' rights, as you fight for trans rights, as you fight for other abled rights, you have to make the university uncomfortable. And if you don't get it, you do what? You shut it down. If we don't get it, shut it down. If we don't get it, if we don't get it, power to the people. You shut it down. But if you're going to shut this thing down, and you must shut this thing down, it takes courage. The problem is we live in a moment that is littered with passivity, self-interest, and cowardice. We live in a world where people will be happy to just take a picture in Trump Tower. Then the fight for the rights of the people where people are so worried about protecting their tenure that they forget about the Freedom Project that got them on the tenure track in the first place. I used to go around telling people, well, it's not up to you, you know, I mean, it's not, it's up to you, it's, it's your choice, you know, it's ain't for everybody. No, you, it ain't your choice. Somebody worked for this thing for you. Somebody died for you to be able to do this work. Somebody sacrificed for you to be able to do this work. Somebody prayed all night so that their kid could have an EDD or a PhD so that they could somehow be in this place. And they didn't do that work. They didn't stand in the gap so that you could be a coward, so that you could do liberal scholarship, so that you could get tenure and walk around looking at the poor kids in the hood who don't even have food to eat. That ain't what they died for. They died so that you could create justice. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to do? No, you might not get tenure. I can't promise you will. No, you might not get all the friends. No, you might not get all the fancy awards. Carter G. Woodson didn't get no fancy awards. Du Bois didn't get celebrated until he died. University of Penn Law to talk about him. Now they gave him a broom closet. They wouldn't even make him an assistant professor. Oh, it's easy to celebrate folk when they die, but if you do this work, you got to be able to sacrifice while you're still alive. And you look around in your department, and when you really sacrifice, you're going to find yourself alone. You, you got colleagues that are radical. So the question of Israel comes up. Then when it comes time to engage and talk about boycott, divestment, and sanctions, the most humane and civil attempt to redress the ugly Israeli occupation of Palestine, and to demand a redrawing of the 67 borders, to demand full rights for Palestinian citizens of Israel, to de demand the right of return. See how quiet y'all get? That's what I'm saying. I don't care. I'm not afraid. You can't be afraid, but you will do it and you will be alone. You will be with your colleagues who love you on race talk, but as soon as it comes time to talk about gender justice, the men disappear and go full hotep on you. I know you feel alone. All your white colleagues love black people till it's time to hire one. I know you feel alone, but alone is what you're supposed to feel because freedom fighters are always alone. Du Bois was nearly alone in 63 when he dies. Malcolm was nearly alone in the Audubon Ballroom. Harriet was alone. Sojourner was alone when the liberal white feminists abandoned her when she demanded, ain't I a woman too? 
You're going to be alone if you do this work. You're going to be by yourself. You're going to feel like nobody's around. And you're right. You are alone. It's going to be two or three of y'all doing this work. Two or three of y'all struggling for justice. Two or three of y'all making freedom happen in your department, in your program, in your school, in your cohort, maybe in your family. But alone is what you got, and you just got to make the best of what you got. Don't complain about what you don't have. Organize with who you do have. Put together a team of people who care about justice, who care about freedom, who are committed to defeating the multinational neoliberal university, and understand, as the great philosopher once told us, the homie said, Hove, it ain't many of us. Less is more, nigga. It's plenty of us. Thank you. Power to the people. Free the land. Free Palestine. Free Mumia. Yo to the noobs. Mark, you've given me many gifts over the course of our beautiful friendship. Perhaps this one was most significant. Thank you for being here. You were exactly what I knew you would be. I Listen, people got to get to uh, 1030 sessions. <laughs> um, I No, really, Mark, you are the most brilliant person I know. And on behalf of the Association for the Study of Higher Education, I thank you for sharing your brilliance with us here in Houston. I love you, I'm proud of you, and I'm grateful for you. Oh, okay. Um, Go to your 1030 sessions. Somebody needs to drop the mic out.